Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family, and we would love to hear from you. All you need to do is send us an email, jimandjoy at EWTN.com. Well, today we have a wonderful guest. Her name is Chris Cotton, and she is the director of Office of Marriage and Family at the Diocese of St. Yeah. Cloud, Minnesota, where it's getting cold up there, she it's said. It's getting cold down here in Birmingham. Come Birmingham, on. oh it is, it's like, it's only gonna be 70 something degrees instead of 98 degrees. It's a cold Two front. Two days ago it was like It's a cold degrees. front, it is. It is pretty but amazing. But Chris Codden's been involved in life, marriage, and the family for many, many years. And it's so wonderful to be a part of EW10 and of this show, because she's gonna lay out really building blocks mm. for the restoration of the life, marriage, and family culture in our country and beyond. And that's good news, right. so that we know that there are some solutions. Another solution is 40 Days for Life, 40daysforlife.com. It kicked off yesterday, mm -hmm. and we had a rally the day before here right. in Birmingham. Candlelight vigil, which was absolutely beautiful and well attended. Had about 150 people in the evening out in front of an abortion center. We had seven abortion mills in Birmingham. We're down to one. And it must go. Yes. And uh, it was just so beautiful to be together cross-denominationally, a growing Hispanic population, mm -hmm. these coming out as whole families out in front of this mill, and uh, just such an encouragement. And one of the key things that encouraged me was the music that was being played. Oh, it was great music. Great worship music. And the young man who was playing it was a member of our former Christian tradition before we came into the Catholic Church. And he was just there playing in front of this abortion mill and people were worshiping the Lord. And I met with him afterwards and I you know, said, hey, Luke, how you doing? And we spoke, we saw him as a young boy. Now he's grown up, mm -hmm. beautiful, handsome young man. He says, you know, I'm getting married, uh, you know, next month or something like that. I said, oh, that's wonderful. And, uh, you know, who are you marrying? So she, well, she's over there. So, you know, his fiance was there, uh, Samantha, I think her name is. And so I said, well, wow, you know, you're called to the vocation of marriage. And I said, I love being married. And, you, know, you know, Joy, I married 39 years to her and we dated six years. And I said, you're going to get to reveal in your marriage Christ's love for the bride. I said, isn't that something? And he said, yeah, I can't wait, you know. And so I said, and then if you have a child or two, uh, then you can reveal the Trinity in a special way, that relationship of the Trinity. And, you know, we have four children and 16 living grandchildren. And I just love being married. And he said, yeah, you know, I just can't wait for that. Spoke to his uh, fiance, I said, very well, pretty girl. She is. Mm -hmm. so, you know, what, what do you What do you love about Luke? She said, everything. It was so great, everything. <laughs> but I thought to myself, wait till they're married a week, then she'll understand. <laughs> Good thing she spoke to me and not you. <laughs> but um, you do, you do love yeah. everything. I'm in 39 years. I still love everything about you. There you go. I do. Um, but I thought to myself, and you know, we have Chris Codden on speaking about restoring a life, marriage, and family culture. Here are people, young families, little children, this man is gonna be married, he's engaged, getting ready to be married, but he's out in front of an abortion mill mm -hmm. with this one he's engaged to. Right. You wanna talk about catechesis and training? Mm -hmm. That's it. Right. Bring your kids there and your family there. And so he's standing against the injustice of abortion, offering resources, and he and she really get it that marriage is not just about them, it's about children. Mm -hmm. Now you would think for many of us that's, oh yeah, well you know what, you don't know how many people don't get that. How many people getting engaged don't understand, they think it's about them Always. and not about yeah, children. Right. But they're about, we, we want to get married, we want to reveal the face of God, we want to have children, and we want to be involved in this culture to build a new culture of life. Right. And 40 Days for Life is an encouragement along that end. It's not mm. only rescuing the children and offering resources, it's catechizing, it's building the church, and it's saying marriage is about children, and children are about marriage. It's a justice issue regarding children, and that's critical. Well, and it is, and so it's so, it's so beautiful where they brought their love for each other and the gifts and the talents that God gave to them, but they brought it out to the streets, right? Because we all have a call to be evangelists for the gospel of life. Amen. And also was there, was one of our former clients. And she came with her brand new baby and she had attended our Earn While You Learn yeah. um, ministry at her choice at our pregnancy medical center. And there she was in the car seat that she earned yeah. and in her snap and go yeah. carriage that she earned. 
And more than that was her beautiful baby boy yeah. um, that she gave birth to. So, and that was, that was so precious it to is. say, Here, here's life, this is good. And, and we all have to stand and defend everything that is evil, unholy, ungodly until it. our dying breath. If you don't know your call and your mission, we're all called to be evangelists for the gospel of life and telling people about Jesus. And there we stood prayerfully, peacefully. So pray for the 40 Days for Life. Also, EWTN has a novena that started this morning right after Mass. So every morning after Mass, the, the, the priest will be praying and leading us all in a novena for our nation. And boy, does our nation need our prayers. So it, will, it started today and it will go till October 7th. Right. And we will pray for our election, for our country, for revival, for renewal, and for God's will to be done. Well, Chris Codden is up next. She's going to share with us the building blocks to build a new culture of life, marriage, and the family. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Well, you are an important part of our EWTN family, and you know, we would love to hear from you today. If you have a question for today's guest, Chris Codden, just give us a call during our live broadcast at 1-800-221-9460. Outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205 Two seven one two nine eight zero. You can always send us an email at Jim and Joy at EWTN.com and hopefully we will use your question right here on the air. Well, it is my pleasure and privilege to bring to you Chris Cotton. And who is she? Well, she's the director of Office of Marriage and Family from the Diocese of St. Cloud. She's married, but I want you to tell our family at home who you are, a little bit about your life, your children, and how you got to this place of being the director of Office and Marriage <laughs> Family. Well, uh, I've been married for 40, almost 40 years in January. Uh, I'm a girl from Chicago who met a boy from Montana in Tucson, Arizona. Boy, wow. So that was totally <laughs> God's plan. Uh, ended up in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Uh -huh. um, and uh, we have three living children, uh, all adults, at least they think they are. And we have four uh, wonderful grandchildren. It's so much fun being a grandma. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why you have to go through sometimes the trials and tribulations of the kids, you know, when they're younger, but uh, yeah. it's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, and we, uh, I've been the director of the Office of Marriage and Family for almost 30 years. Wow. And my husband and I do everything together. So uh, he's just my support, my yeah. lover, and my, my wonderful friend. Yeah. So well, you've been with the diocesan office, and you've mm -hmm. had very close ties with the USCCB mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as a consultant with them. Right. How many years has that been with the uh, For the last bishops? six years, okay. I've been a consultant to the uh, Committee on Laity, Marriage, Family Life, and Youth. Uh, I'm kind of one of the old people on the block as far as family life director, so I think that's how I got on. Bishop Malone calls me Practical Patty. Mm. But there's wonderful theologians that are on the committee, and so they, they talk about all these different issues, and then I raise my hand and say, now the practicality of mm -hmm. this, and kind of go into it. So. Yeah. But, and that's the beauty of the laity, right? Mm -hmm. Is where you get to say, okay, now this is how this is really going to work itself out, exactly. which is so beautiful. But then you also spoke at the World Meeting of Families, right? Just a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, I somehow got on a list and was a presenter on uh, Feeding the Hungry in Marriage and Family was mm -hmm. the title that they gave me. So looking at the... U.S. Bishop's document, Marriage, Love, and Life, the Divine Plan that was uh, voted on in 2009 yeah. and gave us just <clears throat> such a wealth of information of how we can, in the church, grow um, family life and a culture of marriage and family. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's a mouthful. Marriage, love, and life in the divine plan. Mm -hmm. Kind of hits on what I was trying to say at the beginning then, I guess. Marriage, what love is, working that out, and life. Right, they're talking about human life. Exactly. And that connection needs to be made. You know, you go back 30 years or so, 
maybe a little bit more. I mean, it was just assumed that marriage was about the procreation of human life and your own joy and benefit as a couple. Mm -hmm. But that isn't so anymore. I mean, it is not in many cases about the child. I mean, that's so secondary or something to be avoided, unfortunately. It hurts just to say that. Mm -hmm. And when children are conceived, some of them are seen as wrongfully conceived. So well, the, are the bishops trying to bring us back to what marriage actually mm -hmm. is and what it is for and what we're supposed to be doing? Um, how do you see things in the midst of this culture at this time, the, the battle that is raging uh, against marriage and the family and against life and, and the church taking her stand at this time? What's kind of your assessment of things? How do you see things? Well, it's harder. You know, to be in ministry today, it's, it's much harder than it used to be. Uh, back when my husband and I first started, for example, at our pre-Cana classes, uh, we were the moderators, and there was 1,200 couples that came through every year. Now, last year we had 460 mm. just in our diocese. So you can see the decline in those that are seeking marriage. Then also the understanding of what both marriage and our faith is about. Mm -hmm. um, we can't assume, we used to assume that the couples knew their faith, they were going to mass, they really were excited about it. We can't assume that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, in the length of, of time between when a couple uh, or an individual is confirmed to the time that they're married is now such a wide gap. Yeah. They probably haven't been practicing or they don't know. You, you don't want to use that uh, totally, but quite a few of them aren't. Mm -hmm. So we really have a chance, I think, particularly at marriage preparation, to catechize them, to really teach them the faith, enliven that faith, and then do our evangelization with those yeah. couples as they're preparing. Mm -hmm. What, what is the age approximately where we see people leaving the church? You know, like they kind of drift off or make a decision or whatever. What is the age group that that happens? Because you're saying that the engagement time, if those that are returning to be married, is a real opportunity. So where are people drifting away from the church? What is the age? Well, it's very sad, but there's a new study out from the uh, National Federation of Catholic Youth Ministers. And they have it now that uh, people start drifting away between the ages of 13 and 23 mm -hmm. because they're making decisions, this, this isn't for me, it's not as fun as what I'm seeing on TV, or maybe my parents aren't practicing. Uh, a lot of different reasons, but that's really sad. You used to think of college, you know, that was yeah. the kind of right. age, which is still within that, but even 13-year-olds are now yeah. thinking, I don't want to go to Mass, I don't want to be part of this. Which is incredible because confirmation is right around that age, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't it 12, 13 people? Depends come? on the diocese. Mm -hmm. Ours okay. is 16. So. 16. Mm -hmm. And confirmation should be a time where we're really confirming our faith and God's going mm -hmm. to confirm us in the faith. I know that at our center, we have a pregnancy medical center or a crisis pregnancy center. One of the things I really appreciate is that more and more of the parishes are sending their children before they're confirmed to our crisis pregnancy center. So we give mm -hmm. them a pizza party mm -hmm. and share with them. And then we introduce them to the beauty of fetal development. And we speak a bit about abortion and what it is and what happens that they're a survivor generation, these kids, the work that we do in trying to assist women to choose life, those that don't, the healing that we can give them in terms of post-abortion healing. But what it means to be, we separate the boys and the girls to you know, separate them out. I take the guy, she takes the girls, and we speak about chastity, modesty, the vows they're gonna be taking that their parents took for them in their baptism and that you're going to confirm your faith, and God's going to confirm you in the faith to, to know Christ, to, to choose Christ, like the Jewish children, boys were bar mitzvahed. Now is your time to own our faith, and that means chastity, marriage, family, not usury, although none of us do it perfectly. That's what confession is about in the sacraments. Are you sure you want to be a Catholic? I mean, that's what I said. Are you sure you want to be Catholic? Because you had no say when you were baptized. You were born again by word and the Spirit. Now you got to say because this is what it means to be Catholic. So what I'm saying is, I think that's important because this is part of your confirmation. I'm different than this culture. This is a, a death throwaway culture. And for me to be Catholic, and let me tell you something, when you take this position, don't expect the people to applaud for you. Mm -hmm. You gotta have grit, you gotta stand. You know, you may be persecuted, you may be killed. You're so counterculture. You sure right. you wanna be, mm -hmm. but my point is, so we're losing them right, right after this time. What are we doing in confirmation? 
I mean, God, I'm sure, is doing his part. What are we sharing with them? What is this about? Or is it that I'm done, my kid's done, you know, or I did my thing? I, what's going on? Well, we need to start even, I think, a little bit earlier than confirmation because I know I give talks in, I'm known as the sex lady in my diocese. Mm -hmm. How to get that term? Well, I'm the How's woman. How's your husband feeling about that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm the woman that goes into Catholic schools in fifth grade in the spring mm -hmm. and does the talk. Right. And then go back into like junior high and high mm -hmm. school. Yeah. I just did, at a Catholic high school, about a year and a half ago, did a, a presentation and I got some really good feedback that really was alarming. Mm -hmm. Out of the class of about 125, I had five or six that when they wrote down their comments that were already saying, well, I'm either already involved in sexual activity or I'm planning on it. Right. In fact, one young woman wrote me and she says, well, I don't think, I think it's okay to have sex before marriage, but I'm going to wait till I'm 23. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, I'm yeah. not sure what 23, right. and, but the decisions that are being made and where are parents to help them. Now, parents can't solve everything, but I think they can help them give the courage mm -hmm. to help say, you know, you may be countercultural, but this is why we love you and it, we want you to be healthy in every way, uh, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Mm -hmm. And we want to support you in that, and we want to be part of that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we even noticed in our youngest son, he got married he was in mid-20s, late 20s, and um, and I said to him, I said, Wesley, I said, you are counterculture with all your friends because none of them are getting married and none of them are having children. And all, his best buddies, I mean, his good, none are. And it's like, you know, so you want to go and be with friends and just have a good time, but we're like in two different worlds now, you know, and it's not it's not that they're bad. They, they, they just, we're just serving self. You know, so how, what is the church doing and what are you seeing where you're able to say, we got to change this. How, we have to build a different foundation than what we did because we assumed that the domestic church was doing its job. Mm -hmm. And then we assumed that it was coming from the pulpit and then they were being catechized properly. We can't assume any of those things anymore. Well, there's so many holes in the dike right now, we can't just put our finger in one. Mm -hmm. I, I think working with particularly youth, um, the theology of the body is a marvelous way to, to be able to explain it. Kids want to know why. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I love about working with youth today, they want to direct. Mm -hmm. They may not agree with you, but they want you to tell you how it is, right. and then they can make their decisions from there. But the theology of the body yeah. explains the why. Mm -hmm. And so why am I a human person? Why am I a gift from God? And how will I act to kind of help me through that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not just about today, yeah. mm -hmm. but it's about for the, the rest of my life. Right. Uh, and that springs then into like marriage preparation yeah. and all the others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, you know, we have four children, all grown, and I can remember when I in particular shared with them the sex talk or chastity mm -hmm. talk and so on. And, uh, and now with the theology of the body, which came after our rearing of our children, I can remember uh, being with our grand, one of our granddaughters, and you know, I didn't want to go into a whole sharing because that's the parents' place, but we were speaking about relationships, and she was speaking about some boys in school or something, just a, a nice you know conversation, and I just kind of went in in a you know short way and kind of light way, just theology of the body, because there's so much confusion also about what it means to be male and female. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to watch not only girls with boys, but girls with girls and boys with boys. You know, and what's happening and advances being made and so on. I just began to share about you know, the human body and that God's trying to speak to us through our bodies. And you know, you know your body and you know how it's arranged and your reproductive system and boys are different and so on. Didn't even go through, through details. And you can tell, right, that your body is saying something, that it's made for you know, being compatible with, with another and that wouldn't be female that for you that would be a male and so that's natural you have feel I just went through this whole thing and, and, and shared about God being a relational being and that he's trying to speak to us through the body as Christ loved the church and as the Trinity is a family so how do we establish a family it's not man and man together or woman and woman it's a man and a woman in marriage making an irreplaceable permanent commitment and if God blesses we have children and God's speaking he's telling us about himself not only through the Bible but through your body and you know what? She really got it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, I wish I had this years back. So that's theology of the body. And it just makes sense because it's so practical. I mean, they're looking at their bodies and saying, my body is speaking. And if I don't really make a true commitment, then I'm lying. I'm a liar with my body and so on. 
So this is critical. And this is essential with young people is what you're saying. We've got to give them this because they want to know the why. They want to know the why. And you know, we, we've learned through science about if you teach children a foreign language at a young age, they learn it. And they, they, can, they can bring it up and they can mm -hmm. understand it. It's the same way with our, our human sexuality, that I'm a person made in the image and likeness of God, unrepeatable, irreplaceable, and there's a worth to that. And I don't know, especially our girls that hear that, mm -hmm. that they are so worthy to be yeah. treated well. Right. And not to say that boys aren't, but I think I see more of a problem with girls' self-esteem than I do with boys. Yes. Yeah, and then, but then there's so much you know, this culture is so sexually saturated. And so they get their identity from that. Mm -hmm. So if they're not hearing, you are unique, you are irreplaceable, you know, you are unrepeatable, you're not hearing that, and you are made in the image and likeness of God, and you were made for God, and you're going back to God. If they're not hearing that language, they're like, well, who does the culture say that I am? And then they buy that, mm -hmm. and then I have to look like that, and then I have to dress like that, and then, and then I have to become that. You know, so so how how do we change it? How do we put a plug in one dike? And because you did, it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes it's a tsunami. You're like, Lord, mm -hmm. how are we going to get out of this? You were saying for the younger people, I guess for all people, theology of the body is really important. But you speak mm -hmm. about engagement mm -hmm. time as a possible opportunity. What should be going on if people are considering marriage and they come to the church? Well, they're knocking on our door. And, you know, and less of them are knocking on our door, but it gives us that opening and to help them, cate to catechize them about what the church is and why all our teachings are so beautiful. You know, okay, it's the next step. That's what a lot of them think. Okay, mm -hmm. grandma would roll if I don't, you know, get married in a church. We have an opportunity because they're coming to us. Although, what is adequate? You know, in marriage preparation, we tell them not to sleep together, not to live together, not to use the pill, um, to go to mass every Sunday, to pray together. We tell them all these things in 12 hours. And is mm. that adequate? Mm. And so marriage preparation, Pope John Paul II, I mean, he really told us it's from the moment of conception until oh. we die. And how we look at that, so when we get into the immediate preparation, Depending on where they're getting married, I know in our diocese we have six months they have to get uh, and announce their bands beforehand. Although to get the right hall, cater, band, um, they have to do that much earlier. Yeah, yeah. And then usually the church is an afterthought. But we can take that afterthought and say we love you, we yeah. want to work with you, we want the best marriage for you. I mean look at the wedding feast at Cana, Christ mm -hmm. blessed the best wine overflowing. That's what we want for you. And let's work together so you can have that happy marriage. Diocese of St. Cloud, we had the Otrembas on and they mentioned mm -hmm. you were part of that committee mm -hmm. that developed this, I guess, inventory, mm -hmm. marital inventory or premarital inventory. inventory. Mm -hmm. Fully engaged. I mean, it's just a great title to be fully engaged. What, what are some of the components of that so that people who are engaged to be married are really fully engaged and have a better shot at having a, a, a beautiful marriage? Well, an inventory has been notorious for looking at communication skills. Yeah. And where is the couple in agreement or disagreement with and how can we work that together? It has all those components, but then we add another layer of how do we look at things through the lens of the church and how can we help teach you about this if you don't know it? i uh, give you an example. We have one of the sections is on Catholic identity, big buzzword in today's mm -hmm. world. And so it's looking at, is mass essential in your marriage on a weekly basis? Is the sacrament of reconciliation, mm -hmm. do you go to that at least annually? Boy, does that open a door. Mm -hmm. We had one young man that was facing us and he says, oh, Chris, if I went to the sacrament of reconciliation, the roof would fall down. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, we'd shore it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it gave us the opportunity to talk to him about Christ Institute, mm -hmm. I think the best marriage enrichment uh, program he could have, mm -hmm. and that was the Sacrament of Reconciliation. When I go to the sacrament, who am I, what sins am I confessing? It's usually things I have done wrong with my husband mm -hmm. or with my mm -hmm. children. Right. And so we are able to see Christ in that. So it's giving them those opportunities as a Catholic to say, here are some tools that you can use in your marriage. This is why the church loves you so much and wants to help you with that. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect. Some of them are the harder ones. Infertility and adoption. Mm -hmm. We know so many of our couples that maybe don't know it yet, but that will have trouble conceiving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet, you talk about infertility at a couple getting married, there's deer in headlights. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is what if. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. They're expecting they're going to get married and two years later they're going to have their son and two years later they're going to have their daughter and they're going to have a perfect family. Mm -hmm. Well, we hope that for them. Mm -hmm. But they hope out of generosity. So, but the pain that comes with uh, infertility, you know, yeah. what could we do to help prepare them if that happens? Yeah. yeah. You know, because we do assume, we all believe that we're promised children, like that's just a promise. Mm -hmm. It's a right. Yeah, and it's Something. not true. And or, or that if I do get pregnant and it wasn't the right time, then I also have the right to abort. You know, mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's where we are. So you have all these voices where you want to be able to say, if you go into your marriage and then one month in or on your honeymoon you got pregnant, how would you receive that child? How open are you to life? Mm -hmm. well, Which having, is part of that. Having a great conversation with Chris Codden, director of the Office of Marriage and Family, Diocese of St. Cloud. She's sharing with us the building blocks to rebuild the culture of life, marriage, and the family. We want to hear from you. We'll be right back. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Well, remember that we want you to be a part of our show. So if you have a question for Chris, give us a call during our live broadcast at 1-800-221-9460. Outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email during the show, jimandjoy at ewtn.com. And hopefully we will use your question on the air. So give us a call or send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. Chris, it's been a great conversation thus far. And I think we've touched on a number of areas. What I like about your experience and your teaching is that you touch on young people. You touch on those getting ready for engagement, young adults. You touch on preparation for marriage, the actual marriage, and you speak about what happens after marriage, because that's kind of like confirmation. You know, people get confirmed and it's like, I got confirmed, I guess I'm done. Then they come back, they do marriage, and I guess that's it, the project's over. But you speak about marriage enrichment and so on. Um, I guess these are part of what you refer to as building blocks. Mm -hmm. So share more with us about the building blocks, because there's so much going on and we can be so overwhelmed in this culture, but we know who wins. Mm -hmm. And he's given us the tools to do this. He's given us blocks to build. We just need to know how to build and what the equipment is and how we do this. What are some of the building blocks or key building blocks that are so important to build this new culture of life, marriage, and family? Well, what we articulated from, it was actually the U.S. Bishops, Marriage, Love, and Life, and the Divine Plan, that there were eight, but six that we're really working on a lot. Not to say the other two aren't important, but forming youth and young adults, uh, preparing, preparing for sacramental marriage, strengthening the married, uh, pastoral caring, divorce healing, and building a culture of life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for example, on strengthening the married, uh, Bishop Joseph Kurtz, who's the current yeah. president of the USCCB, was at a conference that we did a few years ago. And he talked about the experience that he had that a young couple, when they were talking about their experience with marriage preparation, is they felt like a finished product. And he said he thought about it and he says, you know, he, was at, he has a wedding and it's usually, you know, a hot day and, you know, they go through the rehearsal and the preparation and they get to the wedding. And then he says he goes back to the rectory and he said he remembers being able, to, he wrote the name of the couple in the book yeah. and he closed the book and he said, I'm glad that's done. Yeah. And is that how we treat our married couples today? They're done. We shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. uh, Pope Francis talked a lot about the accompaniment, particularly the first five years of marriage. Some would say it should be the first 10, maybe 20, or but at least those first years that are critical. I, I know for myself, when uh, we were first married, we moved five times the first three years of marriage. Oh, my husband that was, was in the test. Yeah, <laughs> my husband was in the military. And, you know, we were struggling with money and intimacy and, and just even what box to open next. Mm -hmm. But it was, I was selfish. I was so selfish. It was all about me. Rich wanted to do something. And you were talking about one of the strengths in, in men is yeah. we want to do it right. Well, he was wanting to do it right, but I was thinking he was doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. And that hurt him. Yeah. 
And so understanding it's not about me, it's about us as a couple. Mm -hmm. Marriage Encounter helped us with that. Yeah. That we went on a marriage encounter and first of all, Rich was able to write more than bullets. He wrote yeah. full sentences. <laughs> right. <laughs> and we were able not only with the good communication tools, yeah. but we learned that we had a responsibility to Holy Mother Church for us saying our vows wow. there, that we had a responsibility to the church to build marriages. Mm -hmm. And we, we started with just uh, wiping tables at a, a pre cana and then became speakers. Mm -hmm. um, so we have that responsibility. Yeah. So even if we think, well, we're not a priest or we, you know, we can't speak, we can witness to that. And that's what we need in today's mm, world. Let's hold, hold that thought. Let's get Anna's on the phone. Your question or your comment, Anna, you're at home with Jim and Joy. Go right ahead. Uh -huh. Hi, Jim and Joy. Um, my name is Anna. I'm calling from New Jersey. Wonderful. We're from New Jersey, too, so it's nice to hear from you. And oh, we're, good we're praying hear. for that terrible accident as well that's taken place in New Jersey, right? In Hoboken. Hoboken, yeah. the train um, crash there. We're praying. I know. It's a terrible tragedy. Go right ahead. Well, my question for you, um, before you were talking about how um, we're losing a lot of youth in the church between the ages of 13 and 23, and years ago, it was more around college age. I was thinking, um, and then you brought up confirmation. Years ago, traditionally in the church, youngsters were confirmed at the age of 12 or 13, um, which is the same age that Jew Jewish children are bar mitzvahs. Right. And Judaism is, you know, the foundation of the Catholic faith. And I believe it's the age of innocence before a child gets to high school, especially if they're in the secular or the public schools, they can be influenced wrongly and they kind of um, become a little sullied by the world and not very receptive to the graces that you receive in confirmation or open to them. Right. So, um, you know, it's, it's a consecration and it's, you know, a safeguarding by the Holy Spirit right. that they receive from the graces conferred upon them. And do you have a particular question that goes with this assessment? Because I think your assessment is very right. interesting. So my question to you is what, what your thoughts are about that. Okay. Thank you so much, Anna. Your thoughts? Well, I can tell you that uh, there's a real debate in a lot of dioceses on when they do confirmation. Um, some would say we should do it younger. A lot of the reasons that Anna just said. Yeah because then they can bring that forward into their adulthood. Some would say we lose them after confirmation because they're considered graduation. Mm -hmm. And so if we keep them longer in the church, the theory is they'll stay longer mm -hmm. in the church. I know the debate's raging. I don't know if one is better than the other. We do know that we have an issue. And I don't know that there's really good statistical data that said one works better than the other. But that's the reason why it's changed. Mm -hmm. The whole thought if they're older making that decision that they'll stay longer in the yeah. church. I want to return to what you were sharing right before Anna's call. And I don't know how you phrased it, but it was very powerful that you said you and your husband came to the understanding after your marriage, difficulties with the marriage, uh, was it through marriage encounter? Yes. Uh -huh. That that helped you to understand your obligation to the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, where is that in marriage prep? You know that that it's a vow not only for you two, but your commitment to the church, and the church is committed to you mm -hmm. to, to help mm -hmm. sustain you in this. Share more about that. Elaborate upon that. Our vows and our commitment to the church and to serve the church. Well, I, my memory is not going to be as good because, you know, they've just changed the right. In fact, the, the new right for celebrating marriage uh, was, went into effect September 8th and has to be used by December 8th. The words are beautiful. Yeah. If a couple would sit down and read the words that are going to be said at their wedding and also look at the intentions, yeah. because we are very intentional in the church. Before you can say your vows, you have to say yes mm -hmm. to three things. Mm -hmm. Have you The new wording is, as you're entering into marriage, do you come here without coercion, freely, and wholeheartedly? Uh, and just think of a, a poor young bride and groom that are mm -hmm. standing, am I, am, I, am I really doing that? You know? right. And yet you're saying you have because it's something you're supposed to be coming with. Mm -hmm. And the next one is, in your preparation for marriage, are you ready to enter the duties of marriage of love, honor for the rest of your lives? Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of mirrors our mm -hmm. vows. And the third one is what we, I think, use a lot in preparation is, will you accept children lovingly from God 
and educate them according to the law of Christ in mm -hmm. his church. Mm -hmm. And part of that, I think, is getting at, uh, Jim, what you were talking yeah. about. We're to educate our children, and there's no age limit on it. And I think right. I, I, w I w didn't know that until our kids were 18. Mm -hmm. So there isn't until you're 18 or until your college loans are paid off or until you're married and happy. Right. We continue to educate mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And so how we can be part of that, it changes when they're adults sure. like you know, yeah. Yeah. but we still need to have the courage mm -hmm. as parents to help our kids as they go forward. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, we have Joseph on the phone. Joseph, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Your question or your comment for Chris? My, my question is this. <clears throat> I'm from the Archdiocese of St. Louis, Missouri. Mm -hmm. A study was done, I think, that for 10 or 20 years, and marriages are down 50 percent. Mm -hmm. What is that one singular issue that is causing the demise of marriage? Is it cultural? Is it economics? What is, what is that one, sing one mm -hmm. singular issue? Boy, that's a Do you have an easier question. question than that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> oh, I, that's a million dollar question. If we had the answer to that, yeah. we would definitely work on that specific thing because I don't think it's just one thing. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's so many. I, yes, it is cultural. Uh, I think, yes, it is financial. It's, it's very expensive for uh, single people to live alone. And for some reason, the idea of women having roommates of wi that are women and men having roommates that are men have se seems to have got out of style. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a bigger problem than that. We don't see them in the pews either as single mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing them in church and being engaged in church. Um, and so I think that's a bigger issue is yeah. keeping them there. Yeah. 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 I think a lot of it is... Um, selfishness. I mean, I really do. And fear. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, oh, I'm going to give myself away, you know, and like, no, I got to retain myself for the rest of my life. And so people are afraid. People, I mean, uh, my brother-in-law Nino said to me, what, what is the meaning of marriage? You know, like, what is it? And it was death. That was my answer. I was like, Nino, we got to die. You have to die to yourself. Mm -hmm. And he goes, that's the answer. Because mm -hmm. if you're not willing to die to yourself mm -hmm. and live for the other with the grace of God Almighty, because I don't die very well without God, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I, I just wouldn't. I wouldn't. I'm not that nice. I love him <laughs> madly. But I could be selfish in a minute, too. Mm -hmm. And I really, I think it's selfishness and fear. And I see it, I mean, on a daily basis, even at the center. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be loved. I want to be in a relationship. I want you to love me because it's good for me. And if we procreate a child out of that, th then I don't, e I don't even want that kind of love. I don't want the responsibility. And it's so much fear and selfishness that is just really grabbed. And God is not the author of fear. And mm -hmm. God is not the author of selfishness, the exact opposite. So really need to you know, work on dying to ourselves, And you learn that in a big family, right? Mm -hmm. That's where you learn that. So if we as Catholics who know that, if we would procreate and have lots of kids, everybody's dying to their self in the family. You gotta wait your turn to go to the bathroom. You gotta wait your turn to take a shower. Mm -hmm. You gotta, you know, as opposed to the whole life being all about you. Thinking about what, you know, Joe's question, I don't know if it's any one thing, it's a lot of what you're sharing, Joy. Uh, I mean, it's demonic mm -hmm. because marriage so manifests Christ's love for the church. So that's there. It's fleshly, just our own selfishness. Um, I think historically, at least in America, I think it goes back to divorce and divorce laws, mm -hmm. liberalizing mm -hmm. of divorce mm -hmm. laws. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was taboo to be divorced. And we know, you know, there's a lot of pain with divorce. And you're mm -hmm. saying we've got to minister to divorce people. I'm just saying historically, mm -hmm. opening that up, more people, especially in Protestant denominations, buying into that. Mm -hmm. More reasons to have divorce, no fault divorce, and on and on and on. Um, the lack of good catechesis in, in our own church, the Catholic Church, not knowing what marriage is, what it does. So I think just liberalization, more acceptance of divorce. And the other thing I think has to be contraception and the pill. Oh, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a historic time in the 60s and saying preventing pregnancy uh, in uh, in marriages, you know, and, and even, out, well, you shouldn't be having that relationship outside of marriage. But once we got not having children and that we can have relationships, intimate sexual relationships, without having, being open to life. Mm -hmm. And you can use natural family planning if you feel there's an important reason why you should not be conceiving at this time, so you abstain. 
But I think the separation of children in the marital relationship and that that relationship of sexual intercourse is made for marriage, that's number one, and separating children out, I think this has led to so many things. Because if the relationship isn't about the procreation of children, it's just for your uh, joy, your benefit, your pleasure, I think that's led to then why do we have to be married? If married people aren't going to have children or are going to uh, contracept or sterilize, even before their marriages, then why can't we have homosexual relationships? Why can't we have multiple things? Why? Because the sexual relationship is about my pleasure. It's not about children. Mm -hmm. And if I have a wrongful child, then I can abort the child. And so this whole child-denying culture development, which stems back to contraception and selfishness and so on, back to the divorce laws, it's that we just are here to have relationships and to feel what we want to feel. It's not about children. Mm -hmm. And it's a justice issue. Children have the right to be conceived in committed, irreplaceable love in marriage. It's justice for the child. And when it's not justice for the child, then we see that not only can we not have them, but we can kill them. Mm -hmm. And this is where we are. And this is why we need major awakening and revival and repentance you know, in our church and in the nation and in the world. And one thing that piggybacks with that is you, you talked about fear joy and the, the, what happens in contraception. It's that separation. What's happened also is our fear of commitment. Mm -hmm. If we can't commit to a child, right. if we can't be open to one another, why are we surprised that marriages fall apart? Mm -hmm. Why do we surprise that marriage doesn't have its uh, God-given luster that it should have? Because we're, we're afraid to commit. Mm -hmm. We're afraid to commit to have a baby. Mm -hmm. um, and you see that even in couples that are choosing marriage. Mm -hmm. right. That, you know, I don't want a baby for this reason for now. So how are we changing to openness to life throughout all of our marriage? About children, yes, but also being open to the life of our beloved, mm -hmm. um, our beloved Christ and our beloved that we've chosen. Mm -hmm. Well, we have Carol on the phone. Carol, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Your question and your comment for Chris. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, I have a daughter and her daughter who are pro-abortion. What can I do or say to make to change their mind so, without being too pushy. Yeah, thank you so much. Boy, um, and you you do the the work in the trenches on, yeah. on this. I, I know that this is your whole life's work yeah. as well. Uh, so I don't know if you have a better answer, but uh, I, I do think that some of the new things that are out today, we talked before about those videos that are out about what abortion is. Mm -hmm. I think those are an excellent way, because I don't think people, and, and you said yeah. this, Jim, before we were talking, yeah. Um, that it, uh, people don't know what abortion is. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think being able to help them understand, it's not just you don't want to have a child, but right. it's really ending of a life. Right. Yeah. And what, you know, we we had a, a woman on our show, and she's going to be our banquet speaker. She had five abortions, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until her last abortion that it was a botched abortion that when she was in the emergency room, the nurse had said to her. Well, what they did was they left baby parts inside of you. And she said, baby parts? Because she was ignorant to the fact that it wasn't a baby. It right. was a blob of tissue. So mm -hmm. part of people, when they say, I'm pro-abortion, they don't know that it's a human life from the moment of conception. Mm -hmm. 23 of his chromosomes, 23 of her chromosomes creates a unique, irreplaceable, unrepeatable human being for all eternity that has a soul. Mm -hmm. So people don't know that they think, oh, no, it's not a baby till three months. Well, Hillary Clinton says the baby doesn't have rights till after it's born. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that's, that's where all this is. And so it's this lie, and people are deceived. They don't know when life begins. So it's instructing the ignorant, and I know you don't want to be pushy, Carol, but we got to tell mm -hmm. everybody mm -hmm. the truth, mm -hmm. and that your daughter was conceived with the moment of conception, not when she was wanted, she you know? And, and that's when she became a human being. And it is hard. I mean, the older your children are, you know, that opportunity is not there when they're very, very young. So you, you can't change your mind, you know? but you can if you get opportunity and live that culture of life and of love. And as you were saying, understand scientifically and medically, not even religiously, what an abortion is. You can find great information about that at Priests for Life. They had a whole campaign. What do you mean when you say abortion? Let her share what an abortion is. And, and let her say whatever. She might say it's choice and a woman's choice. And then you present the scientific facts of how abortions are done 
at the various stages of development, what that looks like, what happens, the dismemberment, the poisoning, the decapitation, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. This isn't an exaggeration, this isn't emotionalism, this is medical science on the sworn testimony by abortionists with images. Is this what you mean when you say abortion? Is this what you mean? And point right to them. So if you can have that conversation, um, so that you can say, at least when we speak about abortion, let's get our facts straight. Right. You have a right to your opinion, but not your facts. And, and, and the deal about the facts is, I, I meet with women that are post-abortive, and they've been lied to. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I come out of the room seeing the wreckage and the woundedness of their soul. I come out of the room and I say, I hate abortion. Why do I hate abortion? Because what it did to that woman. She's mm -hmm. sitting there because she thought she was solving a problem, right. and she is in pain and sorrow and grief and agony and torment and guilt and shame since that moment. I mean, I want to take those to all the pro boards and go, is this what you wanted? And when now, they, now, do you love her now? Because she's broken and wounded because you told her a lie. But he is part of the building block, right? Mm -hmm. So 40% of our congregation of women in our churches are post-abortive. Mm -hmm. And we have priests and others that don't even want to speak about it because they, they don't want to hurt the woman. She's already hurt. Mm -hmm. And so is he. You know, and so we need to share and we need to heal them. We need to offer healing, confidential, beautiful healing through Project Rachel and Rachel's Vineyard and mm -hmm. confession and so on and do that because they need to be healed. They're, they're hurting. They're there already and they can become some of the most eloquent spokespersons on behalf of life. We're going to take a break at this point. More to come in building blocks to build a new culture of life, marriage, and the family. Don't go away. We'll be right back. I've been saying what an important part of the family you are to us. And you know, we would love to have you right here, live on At Home. We have an audience today. People came from all over. California, they hear from Georgia, they are here. Arizona. And Arizona, yeah. we would love to have you. All you, and you want to be a member of our studio audience, you could meet our beautiful guests, you could meet us if you wanted to. We'd love to see you. All you have to do is contact the EWTN Pilgrimage Department. Do that by emailing them at pilgrimages at EWTN.com. Give them a jingle at 205-271-2966, and they will set that whole thing up for you. So come to Birmingham, Alabama, Irondale right here. The heat is breaking, Jim it said is. so in yeah. the beginning of the show. It's going to get cool. Yeah. Come, it's beautiful. But right now we're going to go straight to Rome, where it's been hot in Rome for Joan, too. Let's hear what Joan has for us today. Joan? Greetings from Rome to all of you at home, and I wish you'd been with me this morning. I just came from St. Peter's Basilica, where 29 young men from the United States and one young man from Melbourne, Australia, were ordained deacons. This is the beginning of their fourth year, and next fall they will be ordained uh, priests. In fact, there are a lot of deacons from uh, the United States who were actually ordained in their own diocese, not here today. But it's a beautiful event. Cardinal Sean O'Malley, the Archbishop of Boston, uh, ordained the young men in the presence of, I think there had to be a thousand or more family members, uh, relatives, and good friends of these young men. And um, it's, it's a real important day of the year here at the North American College. And by the way, these deacons represent 27 dioceses. There were two from Boston. As I said, there was the uh, young man from Melbourne, too. Now, the reason this has been a very big day for me, emotionally and personally, I, I've been a big friend, fan, and, and supporter of the North American College uh, ever since I've lived in Rome. And so I, I've gotten to know the staff up there. They're like my family, and surely they're going to become the family, they are the family, of these young men ordained deacons at the end of three uh, years of seminary. And another big thing, of course, is that the families I said were present today, they're the reason, we're, our show is all about families. And, and so we have families whose entire life, the model, the behavior of parents, the prayer life, prayers at meals, daily mass, this is all what led these young men to their vocations. And it's really been a, a, a very special period. And you have families who are such models, and this is what the priests have told me, 
the deacons and, and a lot of the priests at NAC. What pushed them into the, not pushed them, but what made them, the priesthood, become a focus of their life was the life they had in the family. It was this prayer life. It was the sacraments. It was the model behavior of their parents. And a lot of men have even gone into another life, some of the ordained priests. They may have been bankers. They may have been teachers. But you know what? Everybody felt a emptiness in their life. They felt, felt a need for something else. And that something else was the priesthood. So say a prayer today. Join me in praying for these young men. I mean, after all, they're a gift to us. You know why? They are our future priests in our dioceses, our parishes in America. So that's it for now, and back to you at home. Joan, thank you so much for another wonderful report. Chris, some closing thoughts for us. Well, Joan really hit it on the head with those deacons. They know in a family all the issues that they have, and so they can help them. And that's what our parish is, our family of families is meant to do, to give uh, help and support, uh, Retrovi, uh, Project Rachel. Uh, the USCCB has a website, foryourmarriage.org, which great. is an excellent website, has also the things on pornography. So all those things are there. Uh, or they can, they can check us out, too, on our website and, and the uh, Diocese of St. Cloud. Chris, thank you so much for being with us and giving us hope that all together we can build a new culture of life. God bless you. Remember that life, marriage, and the family will prevail. Keep it on EWTN. Bye now.